good afternoon to all the participants. Uh, I am Dr. Sharman Bosch, Customer Relations Manager from Jemitra, and I welcome all the participants today in this edition of COVID webinar series from Jemitra. Today, uh, we are joined in, in the panel by the Managing Director of Jemitra and Company, Mr. Jatin Mahajan. Good afternoon, sir, for joining in. Good afternoon, Dr. Sharman. And our distance. And our distinguished speaker is Professor Ashok Ratan from Pathkind Lab. Good afternoon, Dr. Ratan. It's an honor to have you here today. Good afternoon. The pleasure is mine. And uh, today the theme is on COVID-19 diagnosis, specifically for neutralization antibodies and the testing of it. So uh, before I give the house to uh, Jatin sir, a uh, quick reminder to all of you that this particular session is a scientific session. So with the presentations, I presume everybody would have their own queries. So please feel free to put up your queries after, since the presentation is going on in the chat box and we will take it up at the end of the session. So over to you, James, sir. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sharpanu. Good evening and a very hearty and a warm Welcome to this uh, webinar. Well, this webinar is a series of webinar which has been brought to you by Jmetra and Company. I take this opportunity to introduce myself. I am Jatin Mahajan, Managing Director of Jmetra and Company. Our company's vision is to serve mankind. And we do this by providing the best possible diagnostic solutions to our customers and at the same time raise awareness about the various diseases which are relevant to us. Today, we shall be covering COVID-19 neutralizing tests and its various aspects. Our distinguished speaker for today is Professor Ashok Ratan, who is an internationally reputed microbiologist. He is currently the advisor and mentor of Center of Excellence and Knowledge Forum at Pathkind Diagnostics. Prior to this, he has served various other national and international organizations, such as All India Institute of Medical Sciences at New Delhi, World Health Organization, PAHO, which is the Pan American Healthcare Organization, and also international organizations based out of Sharjah, Port of Spain, Trinidad and Tobago, then Scotland and Germany. Dr. Ratan has more than 25 years of rich experience in the field of diagnostics, research, drug delivery, and besides academics. He has over 100 publications and has 10 international patents to his credit. Now coming to the agenda of the day, which is he would be talking about the COVID-19 neutralizing test and its various aspects and how it can be a game changer in the fight against the pandemic. So without wasting any further time, I'd like to request Professor Ratan to share his insights on this very exciting subject. Over to you, Professor Rath. Thank you, Mr. Bahajit, for your kind words. And I'm grateful for, to Jay Mitra for giving me this opportunity. So let me concentrate on role of neutralizing antibodies in COVID-19. We know that the virus is known as SARS-CoV-2 and it has two very important antigens. The most abundant one is nuclear capsid protein, but nuclear capsid protein is highly immunogenic, but it is enclosed inside the virus. For protection, we need antibodies against spike protein. So spike protein is 
the portion jutting outside and it is against the spike protein that protective antibodies would be raised. This is because we know from SARS, the original SARS, which came about 10 years back, that it is this spike proteins which bind to ACE2 receptors. The large S lysoproteins are used by the virus to gain entry to human cells. They most likely attach to angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptors on the cell membrane allowing the virus entry. The exact mechanism for this is not known. Most likely, as shown here, the human cell ingests the virus in a process known as endocytosis. Once inside the cytoplasm, the endosome opens to reveal the virus's genetic material, a single-stranded RNA. The virus hijacks the cell machinery to replicate the RNA in end proteins. It uses the endoplasmic reticulum to form its M protein outer layer and the all-important S protein. After replication, the virus is carried by the Golgi bodies out of the cell in a process known as exocytosis, so that it can infect other cells. Meanwhile, the stress of viral production on the endoplasmic reticulum eventually leads to apoptosis or cell death. We know from papers coming out of China that when a person suffers from COVID infection, he responds by producing antibodies. Now, it seems to be a dual reaction. If a person has had mild infection, then the amount of antibody produced are small. While if a person has had critical severe infection requiring admission to ICU, he produces copious amount of antibodies. And I think this might explain why the convalescent plasma therapy failed. Because the persons who donated plasma would normally be those who would have had mild or asymptomatic infection. And they would produce very little quantity of antibodies. While the persons who had high titer antibodies had had severe infection and following recovery would not be in a position to donate plasma. That the virus, inf once it causes infection, it leads to protection against reinfection was demonstrated in Beijing by this animal model when they infected four monkeys and after two of them have recovered, they tried to reinfect the monkeys and they could not. So it showed that once a, the animal recovers, there is protection. For, for this virus, which is after all a zoonotic infection, the animal model is Syrian hamsters. And they found that if you transfuse plasma, which has antibodies against the spike protein, then seed and hamsters will be protected because the virus will not be able to bind to ACE2 receptors and gain entry. You would have all heard about human mon mon monoclonal cocktail being administered to the then President Donald Trump. On 2nd, Oct 2nd October, uh, he was tested positive and was given Reginon's cocktail of monoclonal antibodies. And this consisted of two monoclonals, which were against the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. One antibody came from human source and the second antibody came from the mouse source. And together they cleared his viral load and by seventh, he was RT-PCR negative. It's also been reported that if you give high titer plasma therapy from persons who had 
at least anti spike igg of more than 1000 when this is donated to persons who cannot have vaccination or are elderly persons within 72 hours of admission you would help prevent progression to severe disease you would also notice that except for covaxin which is a killed whole cell vaccine every other vaccine is focusing on the spike protein either the messenger rna or messenger rna converted into dna and then inserted into a, a vector as is there in covishield in sputnik and johnson and johnsons but all of them are focusing on spike protein when they analyzed monoclonal antibodies derived from persons who have recovered from uh, from covid infection they noticed that they were on when they when they looked at their epitope mapping they found that the 19 uh, neutralizing antibodies had different epitopes and most of them were binding to either the the end terminal domain or the portion known as receptor binding domain receptor binding domain as the cartoon indicates is the one which binds to ace2 receptors and these monoclonal antibodies have different receptors or epitopes on the receptor binding domain which will help in neutralization but there were multiple of them so if you look at spike protein in detail you would notice that spike protein is a trimeric protein it has two portions s1 and s2 s1 is the one to which the the antibodies bind and it binds to the ace2 receptor while s2 unit is used for fusion it has the fusion protein in the in in the spike protein in the rbd receptor binding domain there is a smaller domain which is receptor binding motif which consists of amino acid 437 to 508 and you would find that if there are mutations in the receptor binding domain the the virus will have the property of immune escape and this is where the various variants which are available b1617 b16171 b16172 which is now known as the delta variant and you would notice that in the receptor binding domain there is this l452r or e484q or uh, t478k this gives it the property of escaping the immune response to a certain degree there are multiple mutations which are accumulating and which is making the spike protein being able the virus being able to spread even though the person is vaccinated uh, to pro, to prevent persons from labeling various mutants from the country of origin as the first mutant was supposed to be the n501y which is the uk one then the south african and the brazil and now indian they have who has decided to name them as alpha beta gamma delta etc et so that we should preferably use these terminologies rather than the country of region just as we used covid rather than wuhan virus for this for the original one in the serological tests the antigen used are the nucleocapsid protein which is inside the virus and could be used only for diagnostic purpose or for natural infection and the spike protein spike protein as i indicated has s1 or s2 
but it is the receptor binding domain which binds to the ACE2 receptor. So if you use receptor binding domain, then you would be specified to the part that binds to ACE2 receptor and it will be more specific. Now the antibodies you can detect could be total, which means a combination of IgM and Ig, IgG. In, in Germany, they have, they appear to give a lot of importance to IgA, but uh, in the rest of the world, total means IgM and IgG, or it could be IgG. Then depending upon the type of assay you use, you could be finding out binding assays or neutralizing assays. Binding assay would mean that it binds to any portion of the spike protein or the RBD, while neutralization is a functional assay. In, in neutralization, the function is that after it has bound, it will prevent the harmful effect of the virus. Ideally, it is done by plaque reduction neutralization test in which we use live replicative competent virus. And this will cause cytopathogenic effect on cultured virus cells. But since the virus is highly pathogenic, we need BSL-3 facilities for doing this. And in India, this has been restricted to only National Institute of Virology in Pune or NCDC in, in Delhi. So to overcome this, people started, the scientists then use lentivirus to, to add spike protein gene expressing spike protein on the surface, but the virus itself is lentivirus, so it is harmless retrovirus. And then you could have the same kind of action of the spike protein without the harmful effect, and you could do the test and BSL-2 facilities. Subsequently, scientists have been able to have recombinant receptor binding domain and also recombinant ACE2 receptors. By making both proteins recombinant, and attaching a conjugate to receptor binding domain, you could then have ELISA, which can then be done in any good lab. The print assay would mean that you take the live virus and you take the antibodies which you are detecting and you make multiple dilutions of that, mix them together incubate for some time, and then pour them over competent grown um, virus cell lines. Once the virus is present, as on your right side, you will see that if the virus is there, it will cause plaque to be formed. So the plaque would be pathogenic, uh, this is cytopathogenic effect on the virus cell lines. And on the, on the left side, you find that they have been neutralized. That would mean that the plasma contain antibodies which will neutralize the plaques and this would be positive. Since this could not be done in, this can only be done in BSL-3 facilities, uh, they could make it into, uh, make it into pseudo virus using a different virus and not the SARS virus. And since the, the nuclear, nucleus is different, it will not have the pathogenic potential, though it has the spike protein. So the action with ACE2 receptors would remain without the risk involved. And as I said, that the scientists have then been able to genetically engineered both RBD as well as ACE2 receptors. And by attaching the conjugate to RBD and then seeing whether the plasma has antibodies or plasma or serum has antibodies which will bind to RBD and therefore neutralize its action 
or ability to bind to ACE2 receptor and ELISA test have been devised. This ELISA test has been tested both in Singapore and in China, and it differentiates between persons who are COVID-19 positive and controls. So as you see here, the differentiation between patients and controls is very clear cut. Looking at inhibition. So since this is inhibition, the cutoff is taken as 30%. If more than 30% inhibition is there, uh, that would mean that, that this test is positive. Now, in our own results, as I have indicated to you, that uh, either persons react very little or they produce copious amount of antibodies. We have done both nuclear capsid protein antibodies, and you'll find that majority of persons have very little antibodies. And we have spike protein antibodies. Again, about 1,462 were negative, uh, 11, 20, um, anything below 12 was considered as negative. So you'll find that total negatives were 2,582 and total positives were 1,119. But <coughs> persons over, over 500 type was one only. So you will find that the most of the persons reacted very little. This was done during the time before the vaccines came into the picture. Now, uh, the aim was that uh, anti-spike antibodies were said to be surrogate markers for, uh, for neutralization test. And there is correlation between the presence of, of anti-spike antibodies and neutralization test. But it's then anti-spike antibodies would act as surrogate markers and not the exact markers. But the aim was that this is, again, the anti-spike antibodies are trying to give you an indication on how much neutralizing antibodies would be there. When you look at the results given out by the vaccine, uh, this is Covishield's paper, which was published in Lancet in November. It indicated straight away that if the difference between two doses was less than six feet, uh, if the difference was less, then the antibody, if the difference was 28 days between the first dose and second dose, then antibody titus will be lower. And if the difference was 12 weeks, then the antibody titer, as you notice here, becomes 63,181. So in November itself, we knew that if COVID shield, instead of 28 days, the difference is 12 weeks, then it will be more immunogenic. But when the regulators gave permission, they said the permission is given to the original schedule, which was 28 days. And that is why Government of India started initially with 28 days. And now, uh, partly because of scarcity, but also because of evidence, which they have realized again, that if the gap between the first and the second dose is more, then you have more potent results. There was another paper which indicated that if you're already zero positive, if a person is already zero positive, then one dose of injection would give much higher titer than if a person was zero negative. And the second dose will not add much to what the first dose has given, indicating that if you're already zero positive, then one dose would give you protective immunity. And the second dose will only increase the systemic side effects. So the, the percentage of systemic side effects will become more if you take the second dose of vaccination. This was also seen in healthcare workers who were either symptomatic or asymptomatic, if they were zero positive, one dose would be enough 
to fully vaccinate them. To add to the confusion uh, is a paper by Muller, which indicates that the immune response is age dependent. So younger, they took 176 volunteers, 61 of them were below 60 years of age and 85 were over 80 years of age. And they vaccinated all of them. Then they determined the binding antibodies, neutralizing antibodies after the first and second dose. And they found that 31.3% of older age group did not produce neutralizing antibodies versus 2.2% of younger age group, indicating that not everybody produces protective antibodies. And that is why I was surprised that no authority indicates that we should look for antibodies. While it is very critical to know whether you have responded to the vaccine or you have not responded to the vaccine. And if if a person is older, this, this appears that as a person gets older, his immune response becomes weaker and he may not respond to the two doses that are given. So maybe a third dose or a different vaccine may be required, but he's not protected if he doesn't have neutralizing antibodies. This is what they have indicated that if the age is lower, then you produce copious amount of binding antibodies or neutralizing antibodies but after the second dose. While if the age is higher, 85 and above, would be, which would be equivalent to 70 or, or so in India, then your immune response is lower, your cell mediated and your uh, immune response both by binding and neutralizing antibodies are lower than if you are younger age group. When the variants came into the picture, Pfizer generated data to indicate that using a variant and neutralizing antibodies, they found that there was no loss of activity if instead of N501, you use Y501 there was no loss of activity. On the other hand, Moderna indicated that as long as you were dealing with the N501Y mutation, there is no loss of activity. But the moment you go to the South African or the Brazil strain, then there is at least 30 to 70% loss of activity. Monoclonal antibodies, in the meantime, therapeutic monoclonal antibodies have been made. They are all neutralizing antibodies, which has been humanized so that they could be used for therapy. Uh, initially, they, they had BAM lanivimab, but BAM lanivimab does not seem to work against the mutants. So initially, they tried to combine it as make it as a as a mixture and now they have combined it with an uh, in India Roche and Cipla has gotten Cassidy map and I am I am Devi map this combined together have good activity recently on 26th May US FDA gave EUA to GSK and GSK and Veers to uh, so uh, V map, which is one dose of 500 milligrams IV, this needs to be given within three days of a person uh, becoming RT-PCR positive. And if you give the dose early, then there is 85% efficacy in reduction of hospitalization and death, and it is active against all variants and this should be made available in India. So neutralizing antibodies are useful not only to detect whether you have responded to antibodies, but also 
to to give protection to persons for as treatment now uh, south korea has also made uh, neutralizing antibodies available and these neutralizing antibodies will work against all the types of strains that are available what is the correlate of protection so how much dose is required for protection to occur uh, mcmohan did the experiment in monkeys so i would caution that this results are in monkeys and we should extrapolate to human beings at our own risk but what they did was they took convalescent plasma from monkeys who had recovered from covid infection they purified igg antibodies and then they injected 250 mg per kg body weight to one group 25 mg per kg body weight to the second group and 2.5 mg per kg body weight to the third group and to the fourth group they did not give any antibodies then they infected all of them they found that only the animals which had got 250 mg per kg body weight they were fully protected and when they were fully protected when they did the test from their plasma they found that anti spike antibodies titer was 400 rbd elisa titer was 100 and neutralizing antibody titers was 50 they also depleted cd8 t cells in some convalescent monkeys and then they found that this protection was lost indicating that not only neutralizing antibodies is important but cell mediated immune response may also contribute to protection but i think we need more information on what role T cells and uh, T cells play in protection. So in this this cartoon, I'm trying to indicate that ACE2 receptors are present on human tissues, and spike protein will bind to ACE2 receptors, leading to fusion of the membranes between the cell membrane and the cell. And it's these antibodies. the neutralizing antibodies which will bind to receptor binding domain or receptor binding motif which will prevent the union between them and prevent the entry of the virus into the human cell finally lucas has indicated why some persons die and some persons survive working from jail they looked at 229 patients with the full spectrum of covid-19 disease varying from asymptomatic to severe disease uh, in the study correlation was found between anti spike igg levels and length of hospitalization and clinical parameters associated with worse clinical progression indicating that high levels of anti spike antibodies will be present when a person has severe uh, infection although high level high anti spike antibodies correlated with worse disease severity such correlation was time dependent they found that disease patient did not have higher overall immune response than discharged patients however they mounted a robust yet delayed response measured by nts anti rbd and neutralizing levels compared to survivors they noticed that those persons who are going to survive the infection would have neutralizing antibodies generated before 14 days of disease onset and that emerged the presence of neutralizing antibodies on day 14 of the disease emerged as a key factor for recovery from the disease 
mortality in COVID-19 correlated with delayed kinetics of neutralizing antibodies. If on 14th day, you do not have neutralizing antibodies, then it could be a very bad prognosis. So finally, I would like to conclude that infection, COVID infection has three phases, viral phase, pulmonary phase, and inflammatory phase. In the viral phase, the innate immunity kicks in. It is the adaptive immunity, which by 14th day, if it has produced neutralizing antibodies, it will then make sure that the virus is cleared and inflammatory phase is not entered. But if neutralizing antibodies are not produced on 14th day, then we could have bad prognosis. So it is critical to measure neutralizing antibodies on day 14 of either infection or after day 14 after the second dose of infection, of uh, vaccination. I thank you for your attention. You're mute. Thank you, Dr. Ratan, for that awe-inspiring uh, presentation. And I think you have covered almost all the voids as far as this subject is concerned. There are a few questions which are lined up right now. Uh, so I will take one by one for you. Uh, this, the first question is coming. They're saying that how much amount of antibody will be produced generally after the first jab of the vaccine? First jab of the vaccine. Uh, see, it appears that in Covishield, uh, one dose is, uh, they have not quantified it, but uh, it appears to give protection. Uh, if they, they have reviewed literature or results from uh, Israel, Israel, uh, Israel had, uh, has vaccinated nearly the whole population and everything is available, data is available in their uh, in their database. After half a million people were vaccinated, then the people from Cambridge looked at, uh, looked at the results of, uh, of the effect of one, one dose. And they found that in the first eight days, the chances of infection were 2x in those who were vaccinated. And this could be because of change in behavior, stopping of wearing mask. And when I had made this presentation to Dr. K.K. Agawal, and he felt that maybe they would have acquired the, vac the infection during vaccination. And of course, I think we cannot, in India, we cannot rule that out because uh, at vaccination center, at least initially, there used to be a huge crowd and there was no social distancing. So, uh, in the, so from Israeli data, it indicated that you are more susceptible in the first eight days of taking vaccination. Then the second week, second week, there was no change. But after 21 days of the first dose, your protection was 90%. So, and... Uh, Covishield has also published data in Nature, sorry, in Lancet, indicating that one dose itself is protective to more than 65%. So uh, one dose of those who respond, I think the key bit I'm trying to make here is that not everybody responds. I can give my own example. I took the vaccination when it became due in the second week of January. Then when 28 days passed and we were debating whether we should take the second dose or wait longer, I had reviewed the literature and it indicated that the longer you wait, the more antibodies you would have. So I said, let me find out what is the level of antibodies I have produced. When I tested against anti-spike, I had less than 3.8. Mm. 
arbitrarily unit per ml. So I went and took the second dose. After, 20, after 15 days of second dose, I tested again. Again, I have not produced any dose. And yesterday, I tested once again, and I'm, I was at 23. So again, that would mean that I have not produced a copious amount of antibodies. But most of my colleagues who have either taken vaccination or have recovered from infection have very high titers of antibodies. And since most of the healthcare workers are young, healthy individuals and they have high neutralizing antibodies, I would urge them to donate their plasma to help persons, elderly persons who have not been able to take the vaccination or who have not responded. That will save their lives if this plasma is given within 72 hours of them turning RT-PCR positive. Or of course, monoclonal antibodies are commercially available at high cost, but monoclonal antibodies will do the same function as the tighter, high titer sera that most of my colleagues contain now. So uh, there is a question uh, that will it be possible to differentiate between the neutralizing antibodies which are produced in the body, like the ones which are produced by natural infection and the ones which are produced by the effect of vaccination? No, the, 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 there would not be any difference. But whether a person has, has a natural infection or has suffered from clinical infection, you could make out by doing antibodies against nuclear capsid protein, which none of the vaccine except Covaxin has, because you would produce antibodies to spike protein. While if you test against spike protein and nuclear capsid protein, if you have antibodies to both, that means you have recovered from a natural infection. If you have antibodies only to spike protein, then that is as a consequence of vaccine, except for co-vaccine. Good point, sir. And sir, uh, there are a couple of doctors who have asked you some questions, sir. So they have asked like, uh, like why some people are testing positive even after vaccination? And is it due to the efficacy of COVID vaccine is more than the other vaccines or something like that? The, uh, it is, uh, this was, as, as you know, that the spike protein which is used is the Wuhan spike protein. The original spike protein has been used in Pfizer vaccine, in Moderna vaccine, in Covishield vaccine, in Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and in Sputnik vaccine. And as long as the mutation was only uh, D614G uh, uh, or N501Y, that mutation led to increased in, uh, increase in spread, ease of spread, but there was no immune escape. Once the mutation was the E mutation, that means E484Y, uh, E484K or E484Q, that mutation in the, uh, in the RBM has led to immune escape. And as we try to indicate that that has led to decrease in immune protection. So the new vaccine, and even though we were vaccinated, even though we have been vaccinated, the Delta variant, which is circulating in India, has immune escape because it has mutation in E484Q. So it escapes the immunity. But the fact remains that majority of persons who have been vaccinated, they have mild disease, vis-a-vis -vis those who are not vaccinated, which will have severe disease and die. So those of us who do not produce neutralizing antibodies on 14 day, even after vaccination, would be susceptible to new infection and would have fatal outcome. But those of us who have responded to the vaccine would then have only mild infection when we even when the variant affects us. 
Uh, sir, there is one more question there. People are asking, uh, like, uh, after the first dose, the immunity is dropping significantly. So, will it be uh, some kind of Blitzman effect coming into play? See, um, normally what would happen is that once you get vaccination, you have uh, you get the first first dose is the priming dose, second dose act as the booster dose. So you have the highest level of antibodies at that time. Thereafter, over time, the antibody titers will fall, but as and when, but they will be memory T cells and memory B cells. So as and when it meets the new pathogen, it gets another challenge. Copious amount of antibodies will be produced. And of course, uh, initially they talked about vanishing antibodies. Now they say these antibodies may be present for, for a very long time. So I think we need to wait for, instead of speculating, we need to wait for more data to come. But it is there, the evidence is clear that vaccination will protect and it will protect against even the variant. You may get infected, but you'll have a milder infection provided you are responding by producing utilizing antibodies. Uh, uh, there are many questions which are lined up, but due to paucity of time, I will end up with this last question, sir. Uh, Dr. Hafiz Ahmed, he's asking, sir, that uh, since neutralizing antibodies are the new, uh, what you can say, domain which has opened up in diagnostics, that has not been recommended as of yet and not advocated by authorities still. So what do you find the clinical utility of neutralizing antibodies for routine patients in this scenario? I would say that anybody who wants more evidence, they should take antibodies, they should take serum or plasma from persons who are dying and persons who are surviving and look at antibodies. And my contention will be that those who survive have antibodies and those who do not survive do not produce neutralizing antibodies. Uh, sir, I think uh, yeah, you have answered many questions. Uh, I assure all the participants that for the remaining questions, which has not been taken up, we will definitely give you the answers through email and we will post them as soon as possible. So before I go to the next part of the session, I would ask James sir to put in his remarks for the session, please. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Sharbhanu. Uh, Professor Ratan, thank you so much. It's been very interesting to listen to you and to learn from the vast and diverse experience and your learnings. You know, uh, I have found uh, there are some key pointers which I picked up from your presentation. Some of these pointers are the Delta variants, which have been responsible for the havoc of the second uh, wave. The spike protein has chances of escaping the immune response. Also, the significance of the role of the NAB uh, neutralizing antibodies. Uh, the relevance, you know, it plays a very important role and it protects uh, the person from uh, the COVID-19. And uh, it's very important that after the second jab, uh, you, should, you should actually test yourself for the antibodies. So I can probably say that, you know, I'm now more aware uh, about the subject than I was a uh, few minutes back, maybe uh, before we started this presentation. Thanks to your relevance, crisp to the point, deliberations on the subject. I am sure that the viewers have found this session as interesting and as engrossing as I have. So may I present to you the certificate of appreciation. Just share this. Yeah.
So thank you so much for uh, taking the time out and sharing your expert views and insights. Dear viewers, thank you so much for joining this webinar. Uh, this webinar is part of the series of webinars that the company will be having. In fact, this is our effort to support and help the overall growth and development of the diagnostics ecosystems. And as most of you are aware that learning is a continuous process and we will continue to bring in many more subject matter experts and the key opinion leaders will be providing knowledge uh, about the critical and the important information uh, with respect to our segment. So thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, we will meet very soon. And we will also be announcing uh, the next dates for our next seminar. Thank you so much for your patient listening. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Shabban. Uh, thank you, James, sir, for those wonderful words. And uh, uh, before I end, uh, I would just like to share across the uh, product line what we have in Jametra for COVID range. So, just part of the thing. Now, uh, we at Jamitra, we had started off with the diagnostic kits being produced for you know, COVID-19 infection. So I'm not going to go into the pathology and the pathogenesis because that has already been covered a lot. So coming to the serological profile, which even Dr. Ratan had also mentioned the validity of serology also. So if you look into this particular graph, which is very much uh, self-explanatory with the window period, the decline phase and the convalescent phase. Now it is very much critical that at which particular point a patient is actually getting uh, detected and how the treatment plan as well as the diagnostic platform will come into the effect for the proper therapies to come into the play. Now, let me go back last year when we actually had the first wave uh, coming to India. And at that very point itself, it came up with the antibody testing. Now, uh, the main challenges were that how do you get those uh, kids developed because the samples were very much limited, the cohort was limited. And as Dr. Rabin has also highlighted that Indian publications were not in the brink because most of the uh, literature was coming from China itself. So the first part was to understand the significance of detecting the antibodies. So the very first thing which we came up with was detecting of IgG antibodies. And the second part was to detect total antibodies. Now, over here, the total antibody gambit was a cocktail of IgM, IgG, and IgA. Now, as we know that COVID-19 is more of a respiratory disease, so IgA plays a crucial role in identifying the disease itself, especially for the ones who are asymptomatic. So if you are looking for a community surveillance, or if you are looking in a containment zone, or if you are looking into a person who are living in close commune, or probably not maintaining social distancing at all, they are more, much more vulnerable. So you have to look into for the production of these antibodies. So the idea was to develop two kits. So the first kit which we developed was the total antibody kit comprising of IgM, IgG, and IgA. And the second one was the Kavach IgG microdesa. Now to just to give you a recap of Kavach, that it is a product which has been conceived by ICMR and we have developed under the technology transfer over here. So now the total antibody kit has proved to be a successful one with a sensitivity of 94.04% and a specificity of 100% and was evaluated by National AIDS Research Institute, Pune, ICMR. Similarly, uh, coverage antibody kit was developed by NIV Pune 
in themselves and we manufactured it over here which is based on indirect ELISA principle now as of late this time because we are already entering a phase where we have a mixed population of uh, vaccinated as well as non-vaccinated people so sooner or later the whole population will definitely get vaccinated so the onus is to understand how the immune response is coming up so neutralizing antibodies takes the center stage so going through what Dr. Ruben has said, and he has emphasized on the various pedigrees of vaccines which are coming in and their efficacies. So this is the modulation of how the neutralizing antibodies will come into play. And uh, the main significance lies with the, we can understand if the person is having a good humoral immunity, whether the vaccination was actually successful or not. And whether the people are still asymptomatic to the infection or not. And as what uh, Dr. Rakan has also said, that how long is it taking for the antibodies to come into the system? So we have to answer all these questions. And last but not the least, whether a person will be actually uh, a viable person to donate the convalescent plasma or not, because the more you have antibodies, the better they are. So to answer all these questions, we do have the neutralizing antibody microlisa test. So it is based on the blocking ELISA technology and having a single washing step. So last but not the least, we have also ventured out with the antigen testing and we have introduced our own antigen card, which is very much a UCT device and is very affordable and easy to use. And the results are obtained within 20 minutes. So I conclude by saying this, that yes, we are committed to address all the challenges of the pandemic, and we are definitely going to bring in newer platforms as the need arises. And as our managing director, James sir has also said that we do have the vision of serving the mankind. So we are committed to it. And none the least, we can always count on all the suggestions coming in from all the cables and all the experts all across the country and i thank once again to our distinguished speaker dr ratan for taking out this valuable time and we look forward to hear more of your uh, suggestions and case studies in your future and it's always awe inspiring to hear you sir thank you so with this i conclude this session and see you in the next series coming up so stay tuned for that thank you Thank you, sir.